Well, you guys are quiet today. You're going to have to get a little bit more boisterous. How many of you are Chiefs fans? Yes, 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 Chiefs. Okay. 49er fans. Okay. Okay. How many of you don't care? Okay, yes. Since you don't care, come to Second Sunday tonight and worship your face off. It's going to be awesome. So many more of you didn't care. Be here. It's going to be the best place to be. It is. Where two or three are gathered, there he is. And we are going to have fun. So I hope you'll come. Okay. Guys, following Jesus is hard. It's good, but it's hard. And I think we do a disservice sometimes when we just talk about my yoke is easy, my burden is light. We just make it seem like it's true. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. He is so kind. What, what I, the scripture I just read, I won't ever place anything on you ill-fitting. That's true. I think we don't understand what that means, though. We think it's like it won't make me uncomfortable. And that's not what it means. It just means it'll fit us. If he puts it on us, it's because he's going he's gonna to make it fit. <laughs> we, don't, we don't believe fully who God says we are. And so we're like, ah, got uncomfortable, must not fit. This is the devil. And the Lord's like, no, I'm actually refining you. I am growing you into something bigger, something more capable, something more able to wear this. He's making us mature. And maturity isn't free. Salvation is free. Okay, say this with me. Salvation is free. Maturity costs you everything. Okay. This is the theme of the message today. Nice. I'm glad you're with me, Andrew. So expensive. You can get in the door for free. But if you want to be a disciple, it's going to cost you everything. I don't want to just get in. That's like the basic. I'm not a basic girl. I don't think any of us are basic. I want that abundant life. I want, I want that crown. Not just for myself, but I do want to get the crown. So I have something again to offer the Lord. To give him back. You guys. Okay. Following Jesus is not the easiest pathway. They don't call it the narrow way for nothing. You ready to go? <laughs> okay. I woke up a few days ago with the story of the rich young ruler just ruminating in my spirit. And as I was reading it, I was like, oh, I identify with him. You know, this story shows up in the Gospels, three out of four of the Gospels. You go to Bible school, they tell you that means it's important. When it shows up three out of four times, it's an important story. There, that whole section in the Gospels is the same accounts over and over again. In Matthew 19, in Mark 10, and in Luke 18, you'll see these accounts. It starts with, you know, um, 
Well, he's saying, let the little children come to me. Come like a child. You can't get into the kingdom unless you have the heart of a child, the faith of a child, the wonder of a child. And then, then there's this story about, and it's not just like a parable. This is a real encounter that happened. So I'm going to read it out of Luke 18. I honestly can't remember which um, version I told you. It's not in there? Okay. Um, I think let's go with the Amplified. Do we have that? Okay. <laughs> Bless your heart. Thank you, Keith. Let's everyone cheer for Keith. And the media team. And all the behind-the-scenes people that make this happen. You guys serve so awesomely. Um, really thankful for you. And Keith is way on top of it. And this week, I just was not. I'm like, I'm so not ready to give you my scriptures for Sunday. This is the story I'm in. <laughs> okay, so we are going to start in verse 18. And I don't normally read out of the Amplified, but today I will. I guess I'm going to look over here. Okay. And a certain ruler asked him, good teacher, you who are essentially and perfectly morally good, only one is that, right? What shall I do to inherit eternal life, to partake of eternal salvation in Messiah's kingdom? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me? essentially and perfectly morally good. No one is essentially and perfectly morally good except God only. So he's calling him out right there. You must see something in me beyond I'm just a good guy. Okay, keep going. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not witness falsely. Honor your father and your mother. These are the references and he replied, this is the rich young ruler, all of these things I've kept from my youth. And Jesus, when he heard it, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell everything that you have and divide the money among the poor, and then you will have rich treasure in heaven. And come back and follow me, become my disciple, join my party, and accompany me. But when he heard this, the rich young ruler, he became distressed, very sorrowful, for he was rich and exceedingly so. Jesus, observing him, said, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it's easier for a camel to enter through the needle's eye than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, and those who heard it were his disciples, by the way, they said, then who can be saved? And he said, what is impossible with men is possible with God. And Peter said, see, we've left our, our, our things, home, family, business, and we have followed you. And Jesus, he said to them, I say to you truly, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive in return many times more than this world and in the coming age, eternal life. Okay, so we're going to stop there. So this, this young, rich guy, it's very, very likely that he was part of the Sanhedrin, but at the very least, and if you don't know what the Sanhedrin is, it's sort of like the Jewish court. Um, they keep the law of Moses, which I, I really believe that he probably was part of the Sanhedrin based on what Jesus said back to him. You keep the law of Moses. This is how you get eternal life. Like he was speaking to him and what he already knew to be true and what he already knew this guy was doing. But this guy was keeping the law, right? And he said, I've been doing all of these things since I was at the age of accountability. I've been keeping these laws. 
And Jesus is saying, this is me, Emily, my interpretation of it. Jesus is saying, then why are you asking me the question? If you've been doing all these things, you're calling to me. You're saying the words that you already know that mean I'm God, right? You're asking, what do I have to do to get eternal life? You already know what you have to do, and you've already been doing it. You also must know that there's more that I'm calling you to, or you wouldn't be asking the question. And this is what he does to this guy. He hits him where his heart is, where his treasure is. Now, it's this, many people use this to talk about poverty and wealth in the church. And if we do that, we're really missing the point. This is not about money unless your whole heart is wrapped up in money. I don't want us to think only about money today. If that's where your treasure is, then think about money, okay? If that's what your whole goal in life is, is to get rich, to build wealth for yourself, listen, there's nothing wrong with building wealth. Jesus is not saying having wealth is the problem. What he's saying is, is if your heart is tangled up in it, and it's going to keep you from following me, this is a problem. Jesus is really just saying, anything that's going to keep you from following me, becoming my disciple, which means to lay your life down. When Jesus called his disciples, he said, leave your boat. Leave your, you know, get out of the fishing boat. Come and follow me. Come live your life with me. And he was calling them in a really intense season because he was only going to be with them for a short time. He wasn't saying, divorce your wife, abandon your kids. He wasn't saying any of those things. He was saying, lay your life down. Unencumber your heart from the things that will cause you to say no to where I'm leading. If there's somewhere I'm leading you and something in your heart will make you go, I won't go. Then you need to check that at the door. And I, I'm like reading this this week, and I'm like, Lord, what are the things in my life that would keep me from following you completely? So this guy, he, he clearly had wealth. And it was no different in that day than it is in this day. If he was a rich young ruler, he had influence. He had status. He didn't just have money. He had people looking to him. I'm trying to think of it in like modern day, like if Jesus were walking in the flesh like he was then on the earth. Let's, let's use a secular person, for example. Like, what if he came up to Elon Musk? He's got a lot of status, not just for his money, but for his brilliant thinking. He's an out-of-the-box thinker. Think whatever you want to about this guy, but boy, is he brilliant. And a lot of people on the earth look to him and say, like, what are you thinking? What are you doing? Who are you voting for? What are you working on right now? Because he's out of the box, because he's brilliant, and he has influence. He revolutionized parts of the auto industry, energy. Um, he's doing, yeah, Twitter. <laughs> really came at us where our heart is, um, social media. But he has influence, right? The dude has money. I think influence and money often go hand in hand, but they don't always. Um, but what would it look like if Jesus came up to Elon Musk and said, lay it all down and follow me? What, I wonder what he would do. I mean, he, I don't even know if he's a follower of Jesus. I kind of don't think he is. Um, but if that question was posed to him, let's just shift gears and go for the church. Church. 
The church has kind of become a bit of an industry, sadly. Where influence and notoriety and fame are a pretty major currency, making you feel like you've arrived. And I would say a lot of the people, like the ones that we really listen to, um, let's just take Bill Johnson, for example. I don't think he ever wanted what he got. I think he was just being a follower of Jesus. And it, it um, gave him influence. It gave him notoriety. It gave him wealth. You know, as, as he was following Jesus, those things happen. But when people see someone like that and they go, oh, that is the hallmark, that is the standard for what it means to be a person who is faithful in the kingdom. And we dismiss the custodian. Or the kids worker. The, like Catherine and Amy, who are right now doing the most beautiful, selfless, servant-hearted thing. Loving on our kids. It, it makes what happens here on the third Saturday of the month look less than when we are clothing the poor and feeding the hungry. And, and that is, I think, the thing that Jesus is addressing here. Our obsession with influence and, or what we think that means, status. There is this, there is this culture that has tried to emerge within, it doesn't, hasn't just tried to emerge, it has emerged and it is, it is big and it is ugly. And Bobby identified it in a way that I had never thought of it. You know, we think about the Jezebel's spirit being something that comes in and, like, has an overt um, attack on the prophetic. Like, you know, twisting and, and attacking them physically or trying to discredit. But Bobby addressed the Jezebel spirit that's at work right now in trying to be legitimate. Legitimizing, the great legitimizer. Do you guys remember that? And it's like, I have to have this and that and the other thing in order to be legitimate. I, I promote myself. I um, want to have status. And it's like, I know this person and start name dropping in the kingdom. And I've done this and I've done that and I've done the other thing. And I was like, oh my gosh, you are right. That is the Jezebel spirit at work. And I think we might go, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't have any of that in me. But I don't think that's true, friends. I want to say that I don't have any of that in myself. Bobby said I didn't have any of that, and that was really kind of him to say. But he doesn't know my wrestle. He doesn't know your wrestle. And in reading this story, I'm hearing the Lord kind of come at me, poke me in the chest, poke you in the chest. Like, what is the thing that you are going, you think you're going hard after the Lord? Like, this, this, this young guy that was doing the law, he knew it forward and backward. If he is part of the Sanhedrin, he's actually holding people to the letter of the law. And yet he's totally missing the point. Um, it's like, I don't know, this morning I just feel like, let's check our hearts. Because where he's leading us, not just us, Jesus' pursuit, but the body, the church, we have to deal with these things. We have to. What if we were asking Jesus today, what do I need to be saved? What do I need to do to be saved? And he said, 
Lay down your status. Abandon your reputation. Pull down your Instagram. Never post a thing about yourself again on Facebook. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care where you are. I don't care who you're hobnobbing with. What if he said that? Take down your website. Or at least adapt it to where there's nothing about yourself. And it's only about me, my message, my mission. Would we argue with him? But Lord, what if, I mean, it's, you know, I'm doing these things to promote the gospel. But Lord, I'm doing these things to, to show people what you're doing. These are, these are the things that I am like. I'm not talking about posting your kids. And maybe, maybe you don't do this. So maybe I'm just talking to a couple of us. But, you know, the, the poor posting, you, I know a lot of you probably don't even have Instagram. So maybe this is just for the few of us in the room and those that are online. But what is the thing that it's like, oh, I was just with so-and-so. Do you understand what I'm saying? Am I making sense? Okay. Like, we post, we don't post, people post their morning devotion with their Bible open and their cup of coffee. It's like a trendy thing to do. Sweet time. I've done it. I don't usually have a cup of coffee. But our relationship with God is is our relationship with God. And honestly, I think our heart is tangled up in a lot of things that are not effective for the kingdom. And I'm, I'm using things that are probably for like, at the very least, like Gen X on down. And I know we have a lot of Gen X on up in this room. Let me say these things, and don't go, well, I don't do that, okay? I'm challenging a spirit this morning. Don't go, I don't do that, because in our own way, we do. How many of you, if you had lunch with Bill Johnson, wouldn't want everyone to know that somehow Sitting at his table legitimizes you as a son or a daughter. When we have some heavy revy, we need the world to know. And I, I, I don't even know exactly what I'm saying, but I feel Holy Spirit challenging our motivations for why we do some of the things that we do and why we go after some of the things that we go after. It's not wrong to write songs. It's not wrong that your songs go all over the world if they bring glory to God. And we have songwriters in the room. Like, you guys are some of the best songwriters I've ever heard. And nobody knows your name yet. Few people know Angela's name. But would we write the songs if nobody heard them? If we never had a single person buy our album? If we never sat on a big stage again? For a room of thousands. I've done both. I'm not chasing that. And I'm not saying that like, whoa, look at me. I'm not chasing that. I have had to wrestle with my own flesh. Because there was a part of me for a lot of years that was like, 
that's what I, that's what I think I'm called to. That's what I want. That's what's going to make me know that I've arrived. Before I said yes to this call, to pastor, there was two doors, and they were both open wide, and the invitation was real. Dave will remember this. Angela, you'll remember this. Certainly my husband will remember this. My mom and dad, I was, there was doors about ready to open for me personally to do the big time, as we would call it. And the Lord asked me to lay it down. And I was like, but Lord, I could, I was doing all the arguing, but Lord, I could affect so many people for your name. And he said, you'll lose your family. You'll lose the anointing. You'll lose the intimacy that you and I have right now. Is it worth it? But if you lay your life down, no one might ever know your name. But I will make you effective on the earth. That happened in, I would say, 2010. And I remember the day where he really confronted me. And I was on the stage when it happened. And he asked me the question in front of a room full of people. No one knew what he was asking me, how deep it went, because we'd been having the conversation privately. But when Amy Ward, now, was Sollers at the time, released a prophetic word to me, it was so personal and so specific to the conversation that the Lord and I had been having. My head went like this, no. My flesh was responding and my spirit said, yes, Lord. Out of my mouth, I said yes. But my head said no. And we all have our own journey in this. This is not about me. I'm just telling you my vulnerable place. I'm confronted about this when I think about my children. Would I go and do the thing if it offends my children? And they don't understand me. And they think, mom has lost it, and frankly, she's a Karen. A Karen. Not Karen Kerner, who is the best. That is a cultural term that their generation says. It's stupid. The same way they go, hey, boomer. You know, it's just, it's like, it's like a, a dig. And for all the Karens of the world, that their real name is Karen, and they're the most amazing human beings, I am so sorry. But would I, would I be surrendered enough I deal with the fallout of the people that I love the very most on the entire earth. It's not me choosing to step away from them, but if they stepped away from me because of where God is leading me, would I go? That is, that is where my treasure is. <laughs> I dealt with the status part. That's fine. I don't care about that now. But I do care about if my kids love me and respect me and think I'm awesome. I want them to think I'm awesome. I want them to be proud of me. I want them to know that I love Jesus more than anything. I want them to know that my life reflects who Jesus is. And sometimes Jesus offends us. Like when he said, drink my blood and eat my body, he meant it. And it's offensive. Would we lay those things down to follow him? Am I making sense?
I don't know what your legitimization is. I don't know what would make you feel like you've arrived. I don't know what your kryptonite is, what you would say, I can't go there, Lord. I can't go there. Is there something that he would ask you to do, that he would invite you in to do? That you would say, I'm sorry, this is as far as we go. I'm just going to take salvation. I'm laying down discipleship. Oh, I know it's not like a nice, cheerful message. But following Jesus is hard. Following Jesus is not popular. Following Jesus will probably actually not get you a lot of status or notoriety. Following Jesus might actually cause you to have family turn against you. Following Jesus might actually invite you into places that are so uncomfortable. What if, oh, I won't say it because it's too stupid, but I honestly, like, some of the political stuff, I don't even need to. But some of the political stuff, I, I am like a d- tried and true Republican conservative. But could I wrap my head around? Would I argue with him to the nth degree and disobey if he told me to do something that was contrary to my staunch conservatism? He's never going to tell you to do something contrary to the Bible. But do we actually trust that God has a plan with the whole world? Do we actually trust that he's sovereign? That he can use wicked people for his good? He does. You're right. But how far does our obedience go? Or how short does it stop? And I just really feel the Lord, like, this is, this is the depth of the message today. I feel him challenging our devotion to him. Not our love for his presence. Not our desire to be in the kingdom. But how how laid down is our life? Am I a disciple? Am I a disciple? Because, you know, when Jesus said, drink my blood and eat my body, the scripture says that some of his disciples left. His disciples The 12 stayed, but some of those who had been following him, town to town, financing his ministry, going everywhere, saying, have you heard about Jesus? Have you been there? They were some of the ones who were there for the feeding of the 5,000, who ate the bread that he broke, that ate some of the, the fish and saw the miracles. Maybe they were even some who had miracles happen in their lives. But when he said, go this far, they were like, ooh. I can't go that far. And I don't think this is the conversation, like, that we are going to have a resolution today. I don't think in this church service you'll know all the things that are, like, your line. But I just, man, this door that we are stepping into, we have to check our heart at the door. This, like, we're never going back to what once was. We cross over, and you can't go back. It's like, I feel like I hear the Lord saying, count the cost. You can never go back. 
The sea is closing behind you. The way back is gone. Make sure you have all of Egypt out of you before you cross over. Because where he's taking us, it is I surrender all or nothing. And once you get there, he's going to challenge you, challenge you, challenge you. Doesn't that sound fun? Yay! I remember something Don Potter said to me years ago. And he was talking about our worship. And we were going through some transitions of just different things on the team. And some of us were having a hard time with it. And I remember some people were like, I want to quit. I want to quit now. And um, because we were being challenged by the leadership of the Lord leading our leadership and it was like, I don't want to do that. And he said, he said this question to me. He said, ask them. Give them an opportunity to cash out now. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, give them an opportunity to cash out now. But tell them, if you cash out now, that's all you get. But if you'll stay in it and you'll submit to the leadership of the Lord, that they're going to get an abundant return on investment. More than they could ever understand in this realm. And I feel like that's what Jesus was saying in some ways to the rich young ruler. Like, you can keep all that you have and keep the law. But you're missing the point. Like, you can cash in now. You can cash in this life. And that's what you get. But you can double down and give all to me and invest it into my ways, which are awesome. You know, I read it this morning, his yoke is easy, his burden is light. It might be heavy, revy, it might be hard, but he's going to help carry it. You're not alone in this. You can cash in now, get that free salvation, or you can count the costs. And go all in. And check your heart. And go the distance. And, and maybe it'll look to many like a waste. I was just thinking about this in my own context. Like, you know, just so many people have said this to me. Like, it's such a, such a waste that you've never done an album such a waste that you've never recorded your stuff, you know. And I have felt like that for a long time, that it's a waste of a God-given gift, right? But I'm like, I don't feel like I'm wasting it when I'm spending it all by myself in the prayer room and nobody sees but Jesus. In fact, it feels so wonderful and so precious. Like, I would never trade that for anything. I would never trade his presence and his intimacy and his nearness. I don't know. CDs don't even sell anymore anyway. Who cares? Like, I'm glad I made that decision. 14 years ago. I've not regretted it a day. 
what's your thing? Lord, I ask for help for each of us, for myself, that um, the only legitimacy that we have is found in you. The only um, identity that we have is in you. And Lord, if you say record 600 albums, we record them. If you say, go to this place, we go. If you say, to put this out there, we say, we will do it. But Lord, if you're not leading us that way, we just surrender. We surrender to you. And Lord, I surrender all of the the lines where I'm like, I don't know if I can go that far. And I pray that you would help each one of us in this room as you bring them to our attention, as you lovingly bring them to our attention. Like, nope, I am not doing that. But if you're leading us, Lord, I pray that you would give us the ability to surrender. That we would never say no, but we would always say yes. Some of us, it really actually might be money in this room. That if you said to sell everything that we had and to give it to the poor or to give it to someone else to steward it, to trust, that was something that you certainly did in the early church. Lord, would we be willing to lay it all down? And to actually believe that you would be that audacious to require that of us. Lord, if it's to, if it's to take a stand and to, to say the unpopular thing, to say the unlovable thing, to say the un likable thing would be be willing to count that cost if you're leading us to do it. But Lord, if you're leading us to shut our mouth and our inclination is to spew our opinion, I pray we would be willing to obey and shut our mouth. Whatever you're leading us to do, God. We want to obey. This interaction that the disciples had with Jesus, it really shook them. It probably exposed their own hearts in that moment. They probably saw some of their own heart exposed in Jesus' interaction with that young man, but they were they were challenged just like we're being challenged today. And you know, we can't fully love God without him loving us first. We can't fully surrender without Holy Spirit leading us. And I hear him saying, I'll help you. I'll teach you. But you got to be willing. And you got to recognize, this is something that we all have to recognize this morning. None of us have arrived. None of us have it all figured out. We might think we do, but we got to be teachable. We got to be pliable. We got to be moldable. And Peter's response was like, Look what I've already done for you, God. Is there more? And Jesus' response is, There might be. 
but don't worry about your life. It's kind of like what Don was saying. If you cash in now, this is what you get. But if you invest fully, if you lay it all down, you're going to get all that you've ever wanted and more. You're, you're going to get all that you've ever wanted and more. You need to trust me. Lean into me. Be willing to surrender. And just hear Jesus this morning, Holy Spirit, the Father, saying, surrender and you will be fine. You're going to be fine. You're going to be okay. I'm going to take care of you. I'm a good dad. For months now, I've been saying, like, the American church just needs to lay down its obsession with comfort and safety. We got to do it. We also need to lay down that thing of legitimization. You're legitimate. You are worthy. You are important because Christ in you, the hope of glory, is in you. Not for anything that you do, not for anything that you say, not for anything that you can build with your own two hands. You're legitimate because he makes us so. It's literally not going to be one thing that you do on this earth. It's going to be, did you love? Did you give me everything you had? And he's going to go, well done. Um, for all you football fans, cute little Brock Purdy. I saw an interview with him. Oh, yeah. He's married, I'm sure. Um, actually, I don't know. I think he is. But he's like this young, awesome guy, great athlete. You know, he's, everybody loves him right now. But he did this interview very recently, and he was saying he did not, he did not want this grip on reality or his importance in life to be because he has a starting role as an NFL quarterback. And he's like, it's very important to me that I recognize that my worth, my value, my identity, like why I'm here on the earth is not to be a starting quarterback on an NFL team or to be in a Super Bowl. And he said, if I do, then... I think God's going to require that role of me because I'm a son, I'm a servant, I'm a disciple. And he said, that whole thing needs to be flipped. My identity is that I'm a son, I'm a servant, I'm a disciple. And God has moved me into this, this sphere of being a quarterback. But Jesus said to him, if you want to try to hold on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life, you'll find it. This is the upside-down kingdom. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and lay your life down at the feet of Jesus. And that's a life worth living. And that's how you save your life. Surrender all. So, if you don't believe me, believe the 49ers quarterback because he probably will lose today and he's going to be challenged with that reality just saying <laughs> she said get off the stage okay I love you guys enter through the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction and there are many who enter into it for the gate that's narrow and the way that's constricted leads to life. And there are a few who find it. Amen. Second Sunday, worship and encounter night. We're just going to worship our faces off. Um... That's at 6.30. So join us here. If you want ministry this morning, if you want to pray, if you want to 
do business with God, you can do that too. But we're just going to invite the ministry team to just come up here and be available to pray. And um, I love you guys. And I'm in it with you. This is not a word to you or at you. It's with you. I'm challenged. I am challenged by the words that the Lord speaks to me. I hope you're challenged too. <laughs> Love you.